Hey everybody, it's Bust with the 316 patch preview review. And so uh, a couple of devs uh, did a thing on Twitch uh, on the previous night and they uh, went through all of the patch notes, talked a bit about them. I didn't get to uh, the chance to watch it, but someone on Reddit uh, put together the, the screenshots of the PowerPoint presentation and shared it on Imager. And so props to whoever did that. That was very nice of you. Uh, and I think this is a great format. Uh, they, they do a lot of kind of clustering things together in logical ways. To where in the past it would just be like champion changes and then other card changes as we'll see it here it has like daybreak changes and nightfall changes and things like that and it's a it's a little bit more cohesive i, I think that, that was a uh, a very interesting way to go about it and i think this kind of community involvement is always quite nice uh, i think at least in my personal opinion I, I think it's nice when the devs talk about things that are about to immediately happen, like this preview patch, or how things happened in the past, like, hey, here's a story about how I designed Master Yi. Uh, and I don't really like it when they start talking about things in the future. It just opens up too many expectations, too much speculation. I don't like a lot of their wording. Uh, but I think things like this are absolutely fantastic. It's just a, a day before the patch comes out, they sit down and talk about all the patch notes and the things that went into it and everything. I think that's pretty uh, wonderful. And so, uh, in terms of the upcoming meta, things are about to change real fast, right? We're going to have this preview patch hit. Uh, three or four days down the road from that, you're going to have your chance to play in the Last Chance Gauntlet. And then a week from that, we're going to be into seasonals. And so, this caught me off guard last season. The, the big preview patch, or the big change patch hit. And then I thought we had another two weeks before seasonals, and that just wasn't the case. And so, I'm at least a little bit more ready for it now. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the kind of ongoing cadence for the rest of time. It feels a little bit off. I'm not sure if it's because like Riot has to uh, take a, a break for, you know, New Year's or take a break for Christmas or whatever. More power to you. I'm glad you get time off work. But um, it, it, I thought that things were supposed to be on kind of like a monthly schedule to where there's uh, a set release and then a month in there's a, a big balance patch and then the next month there's going to be a set release and then the next month there's going to be a big balance patch and that would just go across monthly but with the last set and with this one I think we had uh, the new set release and then a month in we had a big balance patch and then two weeks later we had another set release and then uh, a month in we had a balance patch and then I think after it's seasonals the the next piece of the Dark and Saga will come out and so I'm not entirely if things just got out of sync and they're catching up or what the deal is but uh if you're a competitive player or you follow the competitive scene things are about to change real fast real quick and so uh, to dive on into the patch itself uh, the the big goals whatever uh shake up the meta daybreak nightfall got it and so uh, the first pieces of the changes here the updates to daybreak and the daybreak kit and so leona uh she gets challenger on both the front and the back side Loses out on Overwhelm on the backside, but on the level 2, when you play a Daybreak, uh, she now gets Barrier. Uh, the other cards changed in here. The Sun Guardian uh, was reworked to be this kind of engine unit that you play early and grows throughout the game. Solari Stellacorn upgraded to boost all of your other allies for the remainder of the round. Uh, and then in terms of the spells, the Morning Light now cheaper but it gives a smaller effect, and then the Sunburst costs one less mana. Now, I think these changes are all well and good. I think the problem here isn't with Daybreak. I think the, or I'm sorry, the card here isn't with these particular cards. It's the, the entire kit itself. And so I have kind of like two things to say about it. The first one is uh, what decks are these good against, right? If you want to think of the matchup table with something like a Daybreak deck, uh, it's good against things like Scouts, uh, those mid-rangey kind of rally decks that need to be winning early game challenges. And so your idea with scouts is I attack with a broad wing, I win. Uh, then I get a second attack later and I trade. That's how you get your card advantage, right? Or even better, I, I play my unit early, I attack, I win. I play Misfortune, I attack again with that broad wing and then kill off a one health unit. And then a little bit later, I get to attack and trade. Like these are the big like stylistic things that scouts does. Uh, to get big and have winning boards. Uh, all of the rally decks tend to function like this, whether or not you're playing uh, Poppy or Misfortune, whatever. They all do kind of the same thing. Then when you run into a deck like Daybreak, Daybreak just says, LOL, my units are just so big. And so you Scouts plays their Petrocyte Broadwing. Daybreak goes, here's a 3-6 unit. LOL, you're fucked. <laughs> then you go to the next turn and, and Scouts plays a Misfortune. And then the Daybreak deck gets to play the Solari Stellicorn or whatever, just a giant unit. And, and Scouts can never get those winning combats. It has to make trades, can't build up the boards, and then it can't 
uh, outdo the Daybreak decks uh, uh, stat line. But against a, a lot of the other decks in the format, you're just putting stats on board, right? It doesn't matter. Say like Stella Sun Guardian is a four four. Say the Sun the Stella Corn's a five five. Say Leon is a six six. You make this big gigantic curve of these units, and then you're playing against Nami Twisted Fate, and they're just like, okay, <laughs> uh, I'll play Double Trouble and block. And then you go to the next turn, and they're like, okay, I'll play Double Trouble and block. Uh, I'll put down a shitty unit and block. I'll play a Homecoming on your Leona, and then on like turn eight. I'm just going to play Nami in seven spells and kill you. And it, it, there's just no way for uh, decks like this to interact with that. How do the play patterns work against, like, Lee Sin, right? He plays, okay, I play the the, uh, the tail of the dragon, and then I'm going to generate a little dragonling. My dragonling is now going to shut down your sixth-cost unit. We're just going to put these shitty things on the board turn after turn. And turn eight, I'm just going to OTK you. And and the, the Targon kit doesn't have a ton of ways to deal with this, right? You can play Sunburst, which does nothing against Nami Twisted Fate, or you can play Hush, which is quite strong against Lee Sin, but against Nami Twisted Fate, it doesn't do anything. And so uh, I just ultimately describe pretty much every format since the Sun Disc, at least as long as we've been playing, is you have to be able to overwhelm, you have to be able to, to rally, or you have to be able to elusive uh, to get through decks like this, uh, like this, and then like Nami Twisted Fate. It's just the only way that you can come in and win those games. And the, the Daybreak Kit doesn't have the ways to do that. Uh, you can put a bunch of units on board. You might be able to use Leona to stun your opponent's entire team and get a kill that way. But uh, for the most part, you just can't deal damage to your opposing units. And so uh, I, I don't think that this is going to be relevant. And then what that leads into my second piece is this is why rotations are so important. Uh, it, it's just, uh, I don't know if a rotation is the answer to that kind of thematic building of Runeterra, right? I, I think that that elusive overwhelm rally kind of idea might just be baked into the core of the game, uh, right? Where we have a game to where you can play units on both turns of the game, maybe attack both turns of the game. Like I think just in the core of the game itself, that might just have been kind of been baked into it. But uh, you, you have the opportunities to at least cycle some of these concepts out. And so you can cycle out Nami, and then maybe that gives you an opportunity for Leona and Daybreak to be relevant at another point in the future. Because as it is, these cards are never going to be relevant without a rotation. And even with a rotation, I don't know if that would fix the problem. And so I, I think it's unfortunate in the sense that there is a lot of sentiment in the, in the Reddit community that, you know, rotations are bad. Tell me this, what does this do? What what effect does these changes right here have on the meta? How much time do the devs have to devote to upgrading Leona and the rest of this Daybreak kit and making sure it wasn't uh, you know absurd or anything? I'm going to assume it's just a lot of time. And at what point does it become better for them to just say, okay, uh, you know these cards suck. Uh, they're they're going to be out of the format in, in six months you know, whatever, uh, just like, sorry, <laughs> you know, sorry, not sorry, you're not getting an upgrade. Or uh, on the kind of the flip side of the coin, if, you know, Nami Twisted Fate is really oppressive to the format, how can we really uh, change Nami enough to make her not uh, obnoxious? Or do we just say that this is going to suck for six months and then she'll rotate out of the format? You know, I, I don't have the perfect answer to either of those, but uh, having the dev sit around and rework these mechanics doesn't feel uh, like a great usage of time. And so, Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. I'm just a, I'm just a dumb dumb out here playing the game, but it, it feels like to me this is a giant waste of time and this would be better served as a, a fix with rotation. So on to the next part, Nocturne catches a little bit of an update. Uh, he works on Nightfall and Fearsome now. Uh, Twisted Tree Line works this way as well. I'm curious if we'll see any Nightfall cards printed here soon. Uh, that function under the same theme, or if uh, Nightfall and or Daybreak will be a theme of the uh, upcoming patch. I don't know how relevant these cards are on that term. It is kind of, it feels like Riot does uh, pick these mechanics as the new cards come out. Like with the, the previous set, we saw a bunch of stuff happen with recalls. Uh, and then there were some recall mechanics within the beginning of the Darken Saga. Uh, I'm curious if this is them just kind of tipping their hat to uh, the release of more Daybreak cards and the release of more Nightfall cards. And so uh, that would make these, you know, a little bit more relevant in terms of context if we knew what was going to happen uh, a month down the line, but I can't quite see it now. But in terms of these actual cards, Nocturne is always like right on the edge of being good. It feels like the, no the Nocturne uh, Fearsome decks 
are just like one or two cards away from actually being the real deal. And so I think seeing up the fearsome upgrade to Nocturne is quite important, but the Twisted Tree Line is historically just a terrible card. Uh, just a, a little bit too much work to get the tree line going. It's too bad of a card if you draw it on turn six. And then even if you do, say, draw it on turn six and have the Fearsomes to activate it, you don't get to attack with that Vile Maul for two more turns. And so I don't think these upgrades to Vile Maul or Twisted Tree Line are that big of a deal. It is nice that now that generated Vile Maul in that scenario we just said now counts to your attacking units, but I don't think it's enough to bring the Twisted Tree Line up. But Nocturne uh, is, again, right on the edge of finding a nice uh, Fearsome home. And so these changes are definitely something to think about with him uh, as the, the future cards are released. Okay, so into the nerfs. Hate Spike, back up to two mana. I I'm surprised that they didn't give it any additional uh, attack damage, uh, but it's one of those cards to where it, it was uh, clearly good. I don't know if it was too good, but it was definitely good. And so uh, I, I think with Hate Spike uh, 1.0, which we've reverted just back to, that uh, it's going to see a lot more play than it did initially. I, I think we needed a lot of time for people to figure out uh, the, the Evelyn decks and figure out the, the kind of current state of the Slayers based decks and the like. Uh, I think this is still going to be relevant, but just, of course, not quite as good. Mark of the Storm, though. Uh, I, granted, I'm not an Ezreal Cannon player. We don't play dumb decks like that, but uh, I don't feel like the revert back to two damage is a huge deal to them. Uh, it feels like uh, if you really wanted to kill the units, at least in my opportunities, my <laughs> joyous opportunities getting to play against Ezreal Kinnon, uh, it doesn't feel like the three damage was ever that relevant as much as just the, the chains of stuns. And so I don't think this will be enough to take Ezreal Kinnon off the map. Uh, and so we can move on from it. Now, the high variance decks. I can tell you what has happened here. This is uh, most certainly my fault. Uh, if, you, if you're a regular follower of my, my channel, you might be familiar with these, but if you're new to the show, uh, maybe a little over two weeks ago, I, I jumped into Masters with Mount Targon, and so we used the Aurelian Soul Mount Targon deck. It took me two videos to do it, but we got there. Then, in the very next video, I spent a long time talking about how the executive producer of the game, how his social media posts sound like someone trying to explain to you an equation for getting girls. Now... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to say that people watch my channel. Not too many people watch my channel. But I, I'm just saying it's probably not a coincidence that we have good success with Targon's Peak. We use it to get to Masters. We use it to, to win some gauntlets. We assemble some nice best of three strategies where we ban Nami Twisted Fate and look to play Targon's Peak and concurrent timelines actually in that. Uh, and then uh, they immediately get nerfed. And then in the midst of all that, we, we took a video to uh, describe the executive producer's social media posts in an unflattering fashion. <laughs> then immediately after, the cards get nerfed. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's uh, ca causality and causation or whatever the fucking saying goes. I, I don't know. I'm just saying this is a, the timelines that I'm subscribing to is that uh, it's all my fault. But I will say I am still interested in playing Targon's Peak at Seasonals. Uh, I, I think the deck... Uh, really has a place, especially if people are scared to play pirates because of the recent nerfs, or if they look to move their pirate-based ideals over to Swain, which is a little bit slower. And so uh, I, I think that there might still be a place for the Targon's Peak. We gotta we gotta figure it out quick, but uh, I'm still on board with playing the Peak and maybe even the concurrent timelines. The timelines is definitely a much bigger nerf than the Targon's Peak. You can't do these plays to where you start improvising on turn two with the concurrent timelines, or you can't timelines into Reggie and play it all on turn two, but uh, it's still an extremely powerful effect. And uh, that, that one early game piece of the play doesn't feel like it's enough to really shut it out, right? A lot of the times with the timelines deck, you just win uh, through things like Vi or... Overwhelm Vi is really popular. You win with things like the Buried and the Ice combo. You win with just the mountain of value you get out of the equipment. And then there's this other set of games that you do win with the timelines. And so uh, you're only really attacking one angle of the deck. And it's a powerful angle. I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to say that it's not. But uh, I don't think that this is going to be the death knell of the, the Trundle Timelines-based decks. Uh, I think that there's still 
uh, have a lot of opportunity for them to be strong. Because you can still assemble these games to where, you know, you're always wanting to hit the timelines on turn one, right? But if it's, say, turn four, and you have two mana banked up, and then you get the, to play the timelines into combat cook, and then you still have your timelines set up for the uh, the eight mana iceberg, you're, you're good and dandy, right? It doesn't uh, shut it down too much. And so I think it's still going to be relevant. And so on to Viego. Uh, in terms of rotations, this is another spot to where uh, I had a lot to say. I've hated Viego forever. I hate Viego. I hate Kindred. Uh, they're dumb Shadow Isles cards. You know all know we hate Shadow Isles here. We want to play Noxus. We want to play our Legion Rearguards. We attack a lot. We throw Decimates to the face. And the things that tend to get in the way of that are dumb decks like Kindred decks and dumb decks like Viego decks. And so I've hated them forever. But my question is... Uh, do we nerf Viego, you know, a little bit and a little bit and a little bit to where he's only fringe relevant, or do we nerf him into Oblivion, or do we just leave him as is and rotate him out so that he can still be relevant in a legacy format? And this is the space to where I say, you know, just leave him as is. A 5-mana five 5-4 five uh, hasn't been too bad. If you want to nerf him a little bit, make him a 5-mana a 4-4, four four, sure. And then just let him thrive in the legacy format. Uh, it, it's like, if he gets to stick around, like, uh, you run into the spot to where, like, what do we print that is better than Viego that isn't obnoxious? And, right, there's always going to be a better card in the format, sure, but... Uh, it's really tough to make cards that are better than Viego. Uh, and then if you're making cards that are worse than him, they're just not going to be constructed relevant. And so just kind of leave him as he is, let him uh, take over the format for 18 months and then and then send him to the netherworld that is uh, <laughs> that is the legacy format. I, I think it, it's the, the, the kind of precedent that this sets in, in nerfing Viego a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and eventually nerfing him into Oblivion is that when you do think about that legacy format, he's just going to be garbage forever because he's just going to be too expensive and too nerfed because he got nerfed for the sake of standard and not nerfed for the sake of his longevity. And so I, I think there's something interesting to consider there. Uh, I personally think uh, he's like right on the edge of too good, but he still makes somewhat interesting play patterns. And so, uh, you know, maybe nerf him a little bit, but then not so much to where he's never relevant again. And so feels like he's pushing up to never relevant again, but not quite there. This encroaching mist theme is still quite powerful. So Saiyan Thousand Tailed loses two health, nobody cares. Everybody playing Saiyan Thousand Tailed is either playing it for the card draw or for the ally bonus, not for its two health points. You always just win the game as soon as you play it, and so I don't think the health there is relevant. Uh, the Harrowing, this is one that survives the nerfs a little bit stronger. Uh, there are games where it is relevant to be able to play turn six Harrowing. I'm not saying it's not, but this is one that you typically weren't playing until... Uh, turn 7 or turn 8 or turn 9 anyways. You didn't want to be playing the Harrowing for like 3 units. It never felt good. Uh, and so uh, a 1 mana uh, additional cost here. It's it's a much bigger impact to make a 2 mana card cost 3 than it is to make a 9 mana card cost 10. And so uh, I think the Harrowing is still going to be relevant. Those like Sejuani decks and those uh, Gwen decks that would still want it, still going to want it. Nothing changed there. They're just going to be a turn slower for this big final OTK, which again, it's relevant, but... Uh, not enough to take it out of the format. Rite of Calling, uh, this feels like a good buff. This is probably a fairly safe space for the Rite of Calling. Uh, it, it's one that I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, if we think of the, the first thing you do when you're building a Legends of Runeterra deck is jam six champions into it, uh, I thought it was interesting that you, you have an angle that says, well, I'm just going to play one champion today. And so how can I best take advantage of playing the singular uh, copy of the champion? And that was using things like Rite of Calling. Uh, and so I, I wish that there was a bit more way to do that, a bit more way of saying, okay, I am playing a Nasus deck today. And I need to draw my Nasus, so there has to be ways to actually get him and interact and use with him. Uh, a part of that fixed here and fixing that would be like the boats, right? The, the Leviathan, as we'll see here in a little bit. But... Uh, I wish there were more things like this that would let you kind of break the mold, excuse me, of just being six champions first. Uh, but with all of the Slayer's themes and all the activators for this and everything with it costing zero, probably a little bit too good. Uh, I think the decks that were still interested in that, like if you're playing Mono Kaisa, uh, you're probably still interested in playing Rite of Calling, but uh, it, it takes away a bit of that raw power and those really high-powered early game plays, especially with that improvised unit. Okay, so Riptide Sermon catches a bit of a nerf. Uh, I think it's, I'm surprised mainly that this was nerfed from 
uh, stat points, right? Deals three damage and one nexus damage instead of four and two, as opposed to just making it cost seven. Uh, I think seven would have been a, a bigger boon to this because I think the Riptide Sermon is actually still relevant. I think this is still going to be a very uh, powerful card, especially as we've run through the current format right now where we have a bunch of uh, Gangplank Sejuani, we have a bunch of plunder, or Powder Pandemonium decks. They all still take good advantage of this Nexus damage, but uh, I, I think you can't get away from killing a unit and getting a 3-3 for 6 mana is a pretty good deal, especially if we're going to say a 3-3 costs like 2.5 mana, and so if we get to, say, like kill your 4 mana unit and then get 2.5 mana back out of it, then we got a pretty good deal right away. And then if this is taking down like five and six cost units, then it's just a, a super fantastic deal. And so I don't think the Riptide Sermon is going away. It's definitely weaker, don't get me wrong, but uh, it shouldn't be enough. I think making it cost seven would be more to take it out of the format than changing the stat points on it. Okay, on to Decimate, their least controversial nerf. I think this is actually kind of interesting in that uh, pirates will still want Decimate. Making it cost six mana doesn't change a ton there. You were never playing Decimate on turn three and turn four and still winning the game, right? This was a card that you played on uh, turn six, turn seven, turn eight, and used to just finish off. Uh, and making it cost six mana, again, it is relevant, but uh, it's not enough to make pirates not want to play it. And uh, the decks that are really looking for this burn finisher are still okay to pay six mana for it. I, I think the other thing that gets interesting with this are there a lot of sixth cost matters cards, right? What if we now play Reggie and have a way to close out the game with Decimate? What if uh, we play with Lux and use Decimate to generate final sparks? What if we use Heimerdinger, play Lux, and now generate the good elusive unit? What if we're using Jace to have the Decimate deal eight damage instead of four? Like there's a lot of very interesting things that happen uh, when the price of this goes up from five to six. And so uh, I think that this is a, a quite interesting, you know, nerf in air quotes, and that the decks that really want it don't care to pay six for it, but it does open up a lot of avenue for other decks to actually come in and take advantage of this. I can't wait until we die to a Reggie Decimate. That's going to be fucking choice, but uh, I think at least kind of the saving grace to this is a lot of the decks have not historically worked well with Noxus. Like Noxus, Demacia, Lux doesn't sound very good. The spells there just don't really work. Uh, Nox or... Uh, uh, who was the other one? Heimerdinger, Noxus, kind of the same deal. The spells don't really line up. The the kits don't really line up that well, but uh, you do have to admit the sixth cost turret is the, the key one to be getting. I think it's probably mainly interesting in the concept of, say, like Jace Burn, uh, but we'll see. Uh, I, I think the least controversial nerf, though, is uh, actually this should probably be most controversial nerf <laughs> in, in terms of the, the way that I see Decimate now and the changes for it in the future. And so, uh, with the remaining champion buffs, I think Tom Kinch is garbage and will remain to be garbage. This as a player that has a 10% uh, win rate or so against Soraka Tom Kinch. Just all the decks we love to play get murdered by Soraka Tom Kinch. And so, uh, I'm hoping it's still trash. I don't want to see cards like this pop up. Uh, he does suffer from some of the plague of the format to where he dies to Quietus and doesn't combat real well and uh, has problems with... Uh, building up a, a bunch of investment and then just getting vengeance. And so uh, I don't think that uh, he'll make a big impact, but you know the, the, the tools are certainly there now that you uh, have immediate access to something to do, right? If you're going to invest six mana in a unit, it's nice to be able to make that investment immediately. And so maybe, Tom, I think you're still trash, but maybe you got a place. Uh, the one that is not trash is Fiora. I, I think Fiora is... Uh, arguably more powerful than when she was a 3-3, three, three, uh, getting this 4-4 four, four up to 4 mana. Uh, it's just As we look at the current format, uh, running into things like Double Trouble, running her into things like uh, Tale of the Dragon, generating Dragonlings, like Fiora has uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that she likes to come down in combat now. Uh, and having this 4, four health gives her so much longevity in those terms, especially uh, if you're going to say block your opponent's one drop and their answer to that is wuju style right you used to be able to just kill fiora pretty much any way across the board but now that that one power unit with a spell cast on it only deals three damage fiora still gets to come out and win that combat same with the the cultist one cost spell that that casts twice and, and gives you two stats on either side uh, and so i, I think fiora is going to be quite relevant she's going to be kind of primed to deal with a lot of the problem cards in the format namely things like nami twisted fate and then uh, the Lee Syndex. 
while also still being pretty good against things like pirates and scouts to where you can just drop her on the board, not necessarily plan to win the game with her, but make your opponent worry about you winning the game with her to where they have to like either just avoid combats because you maybe have it. Uh, it gives a lot of play to Fiora, and I think that this might uh, actually be one of the biggest buffs out of the set. I'm really curious to see how she plays out. Okay, one I'm not interested in, though, Master Yi. I think this card's still kind of garbage. Uh, <laughs> he does a permanent cost reduction to the spell in your hand. And I, I just can't, like, imagine the scenario to where this stuff works. Like, I can't piece together what we're supposed to be doing with Master Yi. And so when you read his kit, he wants to just sit on the board, right? You round start, you reduce the cost of a spell, and then if you have flow, he gets the bonuses. So you play him, you say, okay... Can't do anything this turn, boss. You just got to sit because you don't do anything till the next turn. But on that next turn, you still need to have played two spells to get half of his bonus going. So you need to invest like five mana minimum just to get Master Yi started. And it, this just like sounds like a lot of work. I, I've just said a bunch of stuff that doesn't equate to any kind of winning the game. Like when I'm sitting here saying stuff like, yeah, you play Heimerdinger and Decimate and you get a big turret. That shit wins you the game, right? <laughs> you have the sixth cost elusive turret is ready to fucking attack. You've already dealt four. You're dealing 10 this turn now because you have the big, you have the big turret on board. Like these are very simple lines that win you the game. Like I just used at least like 25 words just getting Master Yi started, and none of that shit does anything. And so I, I think for him to be irrelevant, he just needs like a full kit rework. Uh, I, I don't think the stuff that he's doing is ever really going to cut it. And uh, I just don't think that he quite does enough. And it's a bit unfortunate for such a uh, iconic character in the League of Legends universe to uh, just be <laughs> just be in the dregs of nowhere, just hanging out with Soraka being uh, completely irrelevant. And so Orn, if there's ever a reason for a rotation, this is it. How many upgrades are we going to give Orn before he's ever relevant? And so uh, will this ever be better than Sejuani? No, uh, there is no situation where Orn is ever going to be better than Sejuani. So I cleared that one up for you. Now, the next question, uh, in what case is Orn better than Trindamir? Uh, maybe it exists. It's probably kind of rare. But uh, the, the scenarios to where you want Trindamir basically involved him coming down and just immediately winning the game. That's what you want out of your 8-cost, 7-cost, 6-cost big expensive champion. Uh, and Orn doesn't do any of that. He just comes down and puts a bunch of stats on the board. Doesn't even immediately generate that big ram. Uh, he can't like level up in the middle of combat and make a ram. He's just never relevant. And so it's not to say that like a card like this would even be good after a rotation, but... Uh, what are we going to do with the next one, right? Riot wants to come out and print another big seven-cost uh, Freylordian champion. Number one, is it even better than Alpha Wildclaw? Probably not. But <laughs> it's like you're, you're never going to outdo Sejuani without removing Sejuani from the format. And so, uh, you know, maybe just take the Rising Tides out of the mix, you know? <laughs> just get that, get that whole set out of here, and then maybe Orn will have a shot. But uh, it's going to take so much work to make this champion relevant. He needs Overwhelm or a way to rally, a way to elusive, a way to deal damage directly to the face, a way to kill a unit as soon as he comes down. He has to do something other than just provide stats. So, sorry, bro. You're not going to cut it. One that may quite cut it now is Swain. So we'll pull Swain up here. He gets plus one power. Overwhelm on level two. All well and good. If we scroll down a little bit further, the Leviathan also gets an upgrade to where it costs one less, but only pings twice. And so uh, I think these are quite relevant. Uh, I personally didn't play Constructed uh, the last time Swain was good. That was definitely a different world to where uh, a lot of the... Uh, scar grounds kind of units that take damage to deal damage dealt more and so like legion, legion grenadier dealt, dealt two i think imperial demolitionist dealt three uh so they were just all around more powerful and they'd level up swing quicker and so that stuff doesn't quite exist but uh there's not to say that there couldn't be some kind of say like annie twisted fate kind of shell to where you're playing that um uh, Riptide Conservatory landmark kind of control deck uh, that Swain wants to be a part of. And so I think that's probably the place that he would land. Uh, he is definitely more relevant now that he has Overwhelm. Uh, just such a, a super strong chance of uh, pulling off this big uh, OTK kind of strike to where uh, you AoE your opponent's board. And so I do expect him to turn up. I, I don't know the exact world to where you want that to be, but... Uh, I, I think Swain's about to come a little bit back up into relevance. And so, welcome back, bro. <laughs> Alawi, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it takes to get Alawi back to relevance. She, she suffers from uh, 
side problems, right, as to where the tentacle cards were all too good and nerfing the tentacles really comes in and hurts Alawi. Uh, and so I, I think that this is just, uh, you got to kind of chalk it up to a mistake and say that she's done. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, the tentacle slam, had it not gotten nerfed when it did, probably would have just kind of overwhelmed the format. If people would have just been playing Tentacle Slam and Riptide Sermon and Eye of Naga Kaboros all in the same decks, you probably just wouldn't even play a Lowie anymore. <laughs> you probably just find a way to fit all of that into Pirates. And I think people were starting to do that right before the Tentacle Slam nerf hit. And so uh, I, I think that, you know, she's just, uh, she counts on the kit to survive. And without the kit, uh, she doesn't do anything. And that kit was just too good. And uh, I think that's a, a sad day for Alawi. I wish there was a way to start using, say, like, Behold, Alawi, or a Tentacle as a theme. But that would require kind of, like, redoing the whole kit. And so, like, I, I thought it would be kind of interesting with Riptide Sermon to where maybe it does two damage to a unit, but if you Behold a Tentacle, it does four damage to a unit. And so it, it kind of sucks as the base version, but if you have Alawi on the board, then it does more. Uh, I thought that might be kind of an interesting way to uh, take cards like that out of Pirates, but... I don't know. That's probably a really big rework to get all of that going. For the meantime, Allow is just going to suck. Okay, Vile Maul, we talked about you. Uh, Yulia, I hate this card. I don't like seeing cards like this. I think that Spell Shield is okay uh, on expensive stuff. Aurelian Soul, sure. The big Celestial's fine. Uh, the, the, the equipment, what is that? We just got Harazi. That's the one that has Spell Shield. Kind of interesting on an eight cost card, sure. Uh, I do not like two and three cost cards spreading out Spell Shield. Uh, this lands us in a spot to where you just get a bunch of degenerate OTK decks. Uh, and this is now that this is permanent, it plants that ability out there. I don't think the uh, uh, the faded decks are even playing Yulia anymore. I think they all moved to playing that 4 4 for 4 that gives Overwhelm permanently. Maybe that's why, uh, because the Overwhelm was permanent. But uh, I really don't like seeing this spell shield being uh, given out all permanently. It just. Uh, it, it lands into too many decks that aren't that fun to play with. Uh, well, they're fun for us. I like playing the big OTK-style decks, but uh, not so much for the, the general community. I think this one's a mistake. Rock Tree, still garbage. Just get this out of the game. This card's trash. Uh, I don't know at what point this generates enough stats to ever be relevant, but once it gets to the point to where it's generating like four stats, it's become such a high roll card that it has to get nerfed again anyways. This card will never be uh, constructed relevant. Shrieking Spinner now gives out two attack. Uh, this is huge. This is actually quite big. It doesn't take a, a big uh, way of thinking to make this good, right? If we, say, play Elise on turn two, we attack and get a spider. We assume the spider dies because it always dies. We play a random spider on turn two or on turn three. We would just say it's the three, two fearsome. And then on turn four, we attack with the Shrieking Spinner. And then we get to give out plus eight stats. That, that's huge. That's just a huge, 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 huge amount of stats. Uh, and this is a, a quite strong buff. And so uh, I, I think we're going to have to be on the lookout a little bit for Elise Darius to make a bit of a comeback, potentially with the Shrieking Spinner. Now, the downside to the Spinner is it kind of has that poppy issue about it, right? As to where uh, you really need to be playing it on your opponent's turn and then open attacking with it. That could be kind of hard to set up. Uh, and you're kind of telegraphing what you're doing with the Shrieking Spinner and your opponent kind of has the time to save mana to keep it from attacking. And so uh, it, it does have a bit of issues there, but I mean, this is kind of right on board with Poppy, right? <laughs> it's giving out uh, two stats to all of the attackers and it has uh, two power. It's even got one more health than Poppy. And so uh, I, I think there's definitely some potential for power here, uh, especially if uh, Riot plans on printing another spider. Who knows if they do, who knows if they don't. It is interesting as these things come out, like with, again, I can't remember if I, I was thinking to myself this or if I said it already, but with the last set, they they showed uh, some of like the recall mechanics and they printed recall stuff in the new set. And that could happen here again to where maybe we get another spider card or two. Okay, so Ritual Renewed. Uh, whatever. We're never playing this in a deck. We're never playing uh, these kind of control decks that would want this thing. I, I think it's interesting in the same sense of Decimate, to where uh, Decimate can now be generated by Reggie. They, they put this in the range to where you can't generate it with Conchologist or with Reggie. And so it's kind of right there in the middle. Maybe decks want it, maybe they don't. I don't know. The decks we play don't want this, and so uh, I'm not super uh, interested or worried in this one. Maybe it'll have an impact. Maybe something like uh, Lux Karma is kind of interested in this since it can double up and it can cycle and it can be used with Karma and stuff, but the, the, the stuff we play is not interested. 
And so the Reddit favorite, uh, Ripper's Bay, this card is pure garbage. This is arguably worse than the Paper Tree. If you've ever played with or against Lurkers, uh, the, the, the kind of common thing that you're going to see, the big strategy you have to deal with, is to try and keep them from attacking. They want to hit Lurks on turn one, on turn two, on turn three, and your big thing is to shut that down. And so if they're getting to turn five and turn six and Pike is only getting like plus two attack, you've done your job fantastically. And so now you're you're kind of suggesting that you want to be, say we're on the odd attacks, we play Ripper's Bay on turn one, we can't attack on turn two because we don't have that quick attacking unit, and so it's now turn three, the first opportunity we have to activate this thing, and it's only like an 80% chance, and then uh, just because, you know, like spells and stuff, and then beyond that, maybe like half of our units, let's say, already have Lurk, and so this is only doing something like 40% of the time, however that math works out, and so... This just strikes me as pure garbage. I, I can't imagine this ever being relevant. I, I think it's a nice idea. It might be kind of cool in Path of Champions, but in terms of Constructed, uh, this isn't doing anything. All right, the Leviathan. Again, this is quite good. Uh, the reduction in cost is quite strong. This is a fantastic finisher, arguably even better than Swain. And so uh, this is what I think, if we see Swain come into the kind of forefront, I think it's probably because of the Leviathan. I think the downside with the Leviathan is the Nexus ability doesn't go on the stack. And so you can't use this with skill abilities. It just goes uh, directly to the opponent's face. I might be wrong on that one. Uh, it, it does bring in kind of interesting points if it works with uh, uh, the I care about skills abilities, but I don't think it does. All right. Close to the end. Magical Journey plants a chime. Sure. Realms Caretaker gets health. Who cares? The Realms Caretaker is here to OTK. Uh, giving him stat points doesn't matter. Rock Bears are garbage. No one's playing them. Good job. Funsmith, now worse than Gatalist. I don't know why the point of attack ever matters, but she's got one. <laughs> and what do we have here? The Mammoth Shaman, five attack now instead of four. You're right, it does work with Ash and LeBlanc, exclamation point, exclamation point, one, exclamation point. Uh, not excited about this. We tried extensively to get Transform to work. It doesn't. It just needs more support to ever be relevant. Uh, and the last one in the list. This is Tempo. Win Winsinger now has Elusive. Uh, again, I can't imagine what where this comes into relevance it's the it's just going to get like replaced with homecoming and so yeah i think you just like nine times out of ten you would rather have a dancing droplet that you play a homecoming on uh, as opposed to dropping this uh, in this world where a daybreak deck is good then the wind singer becomes quite uh, quite relevant but this would strike me as a change that was quite important to to expedition <laughs> and as we know that is no longer relevant and so I don't think this will make a, any kind of impact on the format, but who knows? You'd be the one to surprise me. And so that is our review of the 316 patch. Stone Cold Steve Austin said that's going to do it, and I hope you enjoyed the video. And so that is going to do it for us today. Hope you maybe learned a thing or two along the way and had a good time watching. Uh, this is Bust, and we thank you for being here.